You're listening to the Option Alpha Podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from OptionAlpha.com, working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online because it's based on one thing, and one thing only, and that's helping you guys make smarter trades. So again, thank you so much for tuning into today's show. On today's show, we are going to be talking about how you can avoid some of the biggest mistakes executing an options order. And in particular, we're going to go through maybe five things that I've kind of like sketched out here that I really want to talk about because order entry is such a huge part of what we do as options traders. And we've often talked about this 80-20 principle before in how you should think about your options trading system, 80% of your focus really should be on executing the best possible order because that's going to lead to all of the potential profits. You know, really good order execution saves you from having to be good at everything else like adjusting and, and management, stop losses, rolling, all of that stuff. If you just take care of order entry and get into the right positions everything else will generally fall into place. Not to say it's all going to happen perfectly, but that is the principle that most of the execution and uh, emphasis should be on order entry. So today I want to go through, like I said, five different things that I think might help you. um, And just as maybe like stop gaps on making sure you don't make these big mistakes um, executing trades, all of which I have done. So it's not to say that I'm totally perfect. I've, I've learned because I've done all of these in one form or another. So the first one is fat finger trades. This one gets like, it obviously gets me at least like a couple times a year. And not to say I've actually done a lot better job, maybe last two years or so, just double checking my orders. But fat finger trades are when you get into a position and you enter a couple extra contracts, right? So if you wanted to do five, you entered 55. And I've, I've done that before because I know that I, you know, hit the button for five, but for some reason it, did it twice. So I had 55 contracts that I now had to quickly unwind, right? Or fat finger trades are uh, the wrong ticker symbol, the wrong direction, which I see a lot people doing. So if we do send out an alert to our pro members or elite members, we're selling a spread, somebody else will buy a spread and they don't know that they did it until, you know, two days later and they're in the wrong position. So it really can mean anything that is surrounding just not checking the order and what the strategy is in general. This is why I highly, highly suggest until you get more familiar with trading that you either do one of two things. You either A, paper trade a ton of that type of strategy. So this repetition idea that I talk about all the time with paper trading, put in 25 iron condor orders, put in 50 iron condor orders on a paper trading platform. It doesn't matter what you do because you're just trying to learn how to place iron condor orders. And you'll see what works and what doesn't, or you'll you know get an idea of if you entered it wrong because you've got 50 of these now. So it's this repetition kind of concept. The other thing I would do is I would analyze every single one of your trades. So this is something I still do, and I don't know why more people don't do this, but I will add any potential trade that I'm looking at. I will add it to my portfolio beta weighting curve to see what the impact is on the overall portfolio. And I still do this to this day. Every time that I make a new trade, I'll add it to the analyze tab inside Thinkorswim and I'll basically look at it and see what the impact is and just make sure that it makes logical sense. Are my break evens wide? Is it adding diversity to my portfolio? Is it giving us more balance? That in and of itself can double check to make sure you're not entering the trade in the wrong direction or the wrong setup. Because what I've done before is I've added trades to the analyze tab and quickly seen that, you know, I added for some reason three extra long legs, right? And so my portfolio curve is now skewed. There's, you know, some weird looks to it. And so that just double checking, I think really, really helps out. So the first thing, like I said, was fat finger trades. Number two is forcing entries because of time. Now, look, I don't know why there's this huge need to rush and do it. You know, the the old adage is like, you know, where's the fire, right? Is why do we need to rush to get trades on? Now, I can understand to some degree, to some degree, the need to get executions faster for something like an earnings trade. But that still doesn't mean, even with earnings trades, that we need to force entries. 
It definitely doesn't mean that we need to use market orders because it can be wildly different than the current price. Remember, the market order is the next price that someone's willing to pay. Could be better, could be worse, and in most cases, it's probably worse because that's how it ha- how you know typically ends up happening. But we don't need to force trades in over time, so we need to be patient with our entries. We need to let the market come to us as a, a common term that people you know use in the trading world. Just enter an order, and if it doesn't get executed, adjust it. You know, after an hour or so, make a tweak to it. Does it still make sense? Are you, you know, trying to chase the market, or are you trying to get into a good position? There is no excuse for chasing the market in the sense that you know, for the sake of getting into a position, you don't ever need to chase or force trades to get into a position. There will be, I promise you, more opportunities in the future. And in some cases, it might end up working out in your favor that you waited a day or two days because you, you know, really wanted to get good pricing or a good setup. There have been many times, many times, and people don't see this on the outside, which is why I talk about it here. Many times where we try to get into a position and we just can't get filled for whatever reason. We're, you know, trading on the right strikes, very liquid strikes. We just can't seem to match up with somebody else to get contracts filled. And that means that we have to wait, you know, a day or so to get into that position. But I'm never going to force it. I'm never going to sacrifice pricing just for the sake of getting filled. Number three is checking the order type. So again, this is just a very simple check that you should do. But what people end up doing is they end up, again, just randomly entering market orders because that's a default in their system. So I see that a lot with coaching clients that market orders are the default versus a limit order when entering positions or the type of order ends up being a GTC or good till canceled order, which means that the order stays active until it's filled. And so what I've seen before with people is they enter an order and it's a limit order. So they have a defined price but it's not an order for today, or they assumed that it was an order for today's market, and it was actually a GTC order, so the order got filled like six days later at totally bad pricing and totally wrong environment because they just didn't check that. So again, just double check your order type. This works on the same thing on stop losses. If you do use stop losses, make sure you understand if you're using a stop market, a stop limit, you know, a trailing stop. Just make sure you really, really take that extra, you know, couple of seconds to double check this. Because I know in my case, sometimes I've I've done that. I've definitely done the uh, the thing where you enter what looks like a day order, but was actually a GTC order because you copied another one. And I get filled the next day, and I'm like, what what the heck is this? Like I didn't mean to get filled on this and have to reverse the trade, and it just you know creates a little bit of panic. So just double check those orders. Number four is market maker baiting. So I won't say that I think that all of the market makers out there bait people, but if you follow me on this, you'll probably have seen this before. You enter an order to say, sell a iron condor for you know $100. And immediately when that order comes in, now the price goes down to $98. So you enter another order for $98. I'm just saying you do it right back to back because you want to force the trade for whatever reason and break rule number two. But you enter an order for $98. And now, as soon as you enter that order for $98, because that's where the market was trading, you start to see that the market price for that iron condor is now $96. And so what's happening is, is that they're seeing the order flow come in and they're trying to bait people into maybe, you know, potentially lower prices in some cases. And they're not necessarily doing this deliberately. It's just how markets happen. They, you know, pricing and bids adjust. And as people bid up, they start to slowly ratchet up prices. As people bid down, they start to slowly ratchet down prices. But just don't get sucked into that that um, that stream of baiting, basically. Um, so if you enter an order for a dollar, let it there for a dollar. You want to make a hundred bucks on the trade. You want to enter it for that price. Leave it there. Let the market trade around your price. See if you get filled. Then wait. And wait could be different for different people. But I usually wait. You know, like an hour or two. You know, I'll go to the gym. I'll go to lunch with my family and girls, and you know, see if it fills. And if not, I'll come back later on your head and see if it really, really moved, you know, and I'm talking, you know, did the market totally change and now I need to adjust strike prices and, you know, readjust the position or is the market now still at 102 and it's been at 102 the whole time. So that might be the price that gets filled. And at that point, then you make the adjustment. Okay. But don't get baited into it. Number five here is the missing strike price logic. So this is something I'm going to coin here is just missing the strike price logic when entering trades, this is um, this is a killer. Uh, and this is something I was guilty of for sure many years ago. Here's how this works out. And follow me on this and let me know in the comments section at show, uh, show 115 if you uh, think this helps out and, and definitely just makes you double check some of your orders that you put in. But let's say 
you're placing an iron condor trade where you're selling inside legs, you're buying outside legs. And on the put side, you do a $5 wide spread. So you sell a put option, you buy a put option that's $5, you know, further out. On the call side, because your put side was $5 wide, you also do a $5 wide spread. And you don't even think about it because you just want to have this balanced iron condor. And I totally get that concept. So I'm just letting you know, I understand where you're coming from because I used to do that too. Where if I did a $5 wide spread on one side, I do a $5 wide spread on the other side just because I wanted it balanced and even. Well, in most cases, when you do that and you don't actually look at the pricing of each of those individual option contracts, sometimes what you'll find, and especially when you do iron condors like the one I just set up in this example, is that the call side options are much, much cheaper. And this happens in low implied volatility markets like we're in right now. So what happens is, is that even though you're doing a $5 wide spread, that long call option that you bought $5 out is already practically worthless and very cheap insurance for your position, which is fine. But you might be able to get the exact same pricing two strikes in on the call side. So let me give you an example. If you're looking at a stock that's trading at $100 and you sell on the call side of this iron condor trade, you sell the 105 and buy the 110. Okay. Very, you know, regular, you know, setup in this case as an example. So stocks trading at $100, you sell the 105 call, you buy the 110 because it's $5 wide. Well, the 110 option may only cost you a dollar because it's so far out and has low likelihood of being hit that it may only cost you a dollar, but it gives you that protection that you need. Well, if you actually look at the whole pricing table, what you might find is that the 108 call option is also a dollar. And so if you just arbitrarily put up or build out a strategy that's $5 wide on the call side, you're missing a real opportunity to reduce risk for the same exact price. Because in this case, you could buy the 108 call option and effectively have a $3 wide spread on the call side, which means that if the stock rallies, you only lose $3 on that side of the trade. So it reduces risk for the same amount of money. Whereas the 108 call is $1, is $1 the 110 call is also $1. So it's this missing strike price logic that I think actually ends up leading people to executing an order that not necessarily is bad, but actually could be a much better order if they just took an extra minute or two to check those strike prices. This is something, honestly, we go through a lot because when we place iron condor trades or even iron butterfly trades, people will see skewed orders come in and they ask me and you know, a lot of the comments that come back to me from pro and elite members is, well, why do we have this skewed trade here? Do we Are we assuming it's going to go higher? Are we assuming it's going to go lower? And my answer is always the same. And no, in most cases, I assume the stock's still going to be you know, the same. But when you just look at pricing, you can see that for the same amount of money, you can reduce your risk on the call side or on the put side. I mean, it can happen on the put side too. It's more common on the call side. But you can reduce your risk by just double checking those strike prices and seeing if it makes logical sense. Now, for full disclosure, that doesn't mean that I always want the same price. It means that if I can come in $3 and it costs me an extra dollar, I'll do that. Because if I can pay, in this case, $2 for the 108 call option, but I've effectively cut $200 of risk per contract on the call side, I'll do that all day, right? So so it's not that there's always going to be this this differential. You always have to look at it and, you know, ask yourself the question, you know, how much risk am I reducing and how much is that costing me? If I have to come in from the 110 to the 108 and it's a $25 difference, maybe I don't do it for that trade, right? Maybe I, you know, still stick with the 110s or maybe I try to do something at 109, something in between that's maybe $5 or $6. But just understanding this missing strike price logic, I think will save you um, a ton of money over time. I know it will because you'll you'll go into situations where the stock does end up making a huge rally and you have much, much, much less risk on the call side of that position. So hopefully this helps out again, just to recap these five things. And and it's really just a matter of just slowing down, you know, your process and double checking things again, really focusing on order entry. Number one was fat finger trades, just frankly, you know, hitting too many buttons and going too fast. Number two is forcing trades, uh, trade entries. Don't force the trades, let the market come to you, let the position kind of mature, get a good fill. Don't force it. Checking your order type to make sure that you're using the right type of order, a limit versus a market, uh, day orders in most cases versus GTC orders. 
not getting baited in by market makers and pricing uh, pricing changes. So leaving the market on again, just being patient. And then number five, uh, checking the strike prices. So double checking your positions to make sure that you're really you know using the effective strike price, the most effective strike price for that particular setup, so that you don't have these missing strike prices and basically are leaving yourself exposed to maybe more risk than you need to at the time. So as always, hopefully this helps out. If you have any questions on this, let me know. And let's get into the Trader Q&A segment. And now our favorite part of the show, Trader Q&A, where we ask a question from one of our current members about options trading. Got a question you'd like to ask Kirk to answer live on the air? Just head on over to optionalpha.com forward slash ask and hit the record button to leave a message. That's optionalpha.com forward slash ask. And now here's today's question. Hello, Kirk. First of all, thank you so much for your time. I have found your webinar very, very useful, even for beginners. But I have a question. How can I know when I'm ready for the real world options market? Thank you. All right, Roddy, thanks so much for uh, submitting a question here. And again, really the crux of the question is, you know, how do I know when I'm ready to trade? In the real world, I guess, in the options market, I think ultimately nobody knows for sure that you're ready to trade in the real real world. Um, I often relate this to the transition between uh, not having kids and having kids. So becoming a parent happens instantly. And once you're a parent, you are just a parent. I mean, you can't go back on that, right? Like you have a kid or you don't have a kid. There's no, uh, there's no giving them back, right? And so in the options world, I think that the same you know, concept makes sense that as soon as you cross the proverbial bridge to real money trading, uh, which can happen at any point and on any scale, now you're in the real world. I believe that everyone could start trading real money right away. I think there's a lot of benefit to trading real money right away. And again, with options, as opposed to stocks, you have the ability to do things very small in scale, very risk defined, meaning you know exactly how much you can make, how much you can lose, the probability of success, the whole deal. The very smallest possible trade that you could probably get into is a credit spread, which has about $70 of risk. So I think it's worth, if you have the stomach to do it initially, to get into trades that have low likelihood um, of of risk, meaning small spreads, small number of contracts, just to get into the real world as quickly as possible. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't paper trade. We've done a whole podcast series on paper trading and how you should do it. So check that out right here on the weekly podcast for Option Alpha. Uh, but I think that paper trading is good to learn the mechanics and the flow, the order entry types, uh, just to get you know kind of your feet or the pedals under your feet and get the bike rolling. Uh, but ultimately, it's not going to take you anywhere until you start actually trading real money. So I think you're probably there. Um, you're probably closer than you think, but don't delay it anymore. You know, probably at this point, get into the market, start making some real trades, even on a small scale, just so you get familiar with it and also start increasing your trade count earlier on. All right. So again, thank you so much for submitting the question. As always, if you guys want to get your question answered here on the podcast or live on Facebook and Periscope, as we've already been doing, please head on over to optionalpha.com slash ask and click the big red button in the middle of the screen and leave me a private voicemail. Again, there's no software to download or install, and it's incredibly easy. Now, before we get into the closing bell segment, where we're going to talk about our new trade in GDX, I want to let you know how you can get your hands on our special podcast freebie today, which is our seven-step entry checklist. So as we're talking about order execution, this entry checklist goes through the seven things that we kind of monitor and check before we get into a position. So again, it's completely free and you can get it by going to optionalpha.com slash seven steps. That's just the number seven and then steps or by texting in the word seven steps to 44222. Again, just the number seven, S-T-E-P-S. If you're on your mobile phone right now, you can just text it in real quick to the short code 44222 and we'll send you a copy to your email address. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. All right, so today we are going to be talking about our new position that we just entered um, a couple days ago in GDX. Uh, GDX is a gold miners ETF, um, very popular ETF, lots of liquidity, lots of people trading it. Um, so probably some of the more popular, you know, metal 
ETFs are GDX, GLD, SLV, et cetera. And so in this case, we're trading GDX because I think the liquidity in GDX is is really good right now. Um, and the pricing, uh, as far as like how we could build out this trade actually ends up working out pretty well. We have a pretty wide margin of the error here, which helps. So where do we come up with this trade? Well, we, we're looking at all of our ETFs and all of our uh, trades that we monitor, or tickers that we monitor inside of our watch list software, which you can get at optionoff.com slash toolbox. And we saw that today uh, when we got into this trade that GDX actually was rallying pretty strong. And I know that gold has been rallying, but then today was up, you know, two and a half percent, something like this, which is kind of uncharacteristic for for GDX to be up such a big, uh, you know, spread on a single day. And so we pulled up the chart and noticed that GDX has basically gone parabolic over the last two weeks. Uh, So it's had a huge move um, from really low pricing. Uh, I think where it was at before was down around $21. And now it's, you know, very close to $24. So huge, huge move in GDX over a very short period of time. Begs the question now, um, is this run overdone? And so when we looked at our technicals that we use from our signals research, we saw that GDX was now finally, just finally starting to create technical sell signals. So all of the indicators that we use were now kind of converging to say, look, if anything, this is probably a better time than not to sell something in GDX, to go bearish on GDX. Now, again, Technical suggests that the stock is going to stop rallying or turn over, not always turn over. And that's where people sometimes mess up with technicals is they assume a buy signal or a sell signal is 100% reversal, but it's not. It's stopping the trend or slowing the trend, trading sideways and or reversing. The beautiful thing about options then is that we have the ability to then decide to use an option selling strategy in this case to give ourselves a margin of error. So if GDX still continues to move higher, we still have the opportunity to make money in this trade, which is very cool. And if GDX trades sideways, we have an opportunity to make money. And if GDX obviously trades lower, we have an opportunity to make money. So that's why we decided to do an option selling strategy as opposed to an option buying strategy. An option buying strategy in this case would have only made money on the directional move lower in GDX, would have forced us and the market to move the direction that we want to be able to make money. So In our case, we're going to go with the credit spread on GDX, where we sold the 24 calls, bought the 26 calls, and that gave us a total credit of $46 per spread. Now, we did this a little bit larger, and for those of you who are on our uh, email list uh, for Pro and Elite members, you saw that we did a couple more contracts on this, just because I think it's a a really good setup, and and we have the ability to get into maybe a slightly bigger position than normal, so you know, not the 5%, obviously we're not doing it super large, but you know, two and a half to 3%, you know, type of trade um, here. Cause I think it's, it's a good trade for the next 45 days and it gives us a lot of margin of error. So again, the time that we made the trade GDX was trading at, you know, 23 and a half or so. And so with our break even point at 24 and a half, we basically are giving ourselves a dollar of extra room. So if GDX rallies another dollar, we still have the opportunity to make money even if it continues this move, which it might. I mean, you know, 24 might be a psychological level. 25 might be a psychological level for people to buy or sell. But I think we're we're in a good setup here and I would do this all day, all night, even if it doesn't work out. So hopefully that helps out. And again, just kind of gives you an example and a little bit more walkthrough about how we found the trade and what the, what the setup is in general and, you know, why we decided to go with the credit spread again was because we wanted to trade this a little bit bearish. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, so I truly hope you guys enjoyed today's show. And as always, got at least one thing out of it that you can apply right now to make you a smarter more profitable trader and investor. As always, you can get additional resources, links mentioned in the show, and some related video training on order execution and entry from today's show by going to optionalpha.com slash show 115. Again, that's just the number 115, optionalpha.com slash show 115. Until next time, happy trading.